much. And we move on to uh, the first speaker of the afternoon session, who is uh, legendary in the field. Um, and legends never die. And legends never die, as we just <laughs> learned. And please welcome Steve Horvath. Uh, actually, you need a mic up. Just one second. Um, I, can, I can come up with a joke. Uh, how does citric acid come to work on his Krebs cycle? <laughs> Very funny. Very funny. All right, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, um, can they see? Okay, you can. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Alex, for inviting me. Such a privilege. Um, the people um, online cannot see the beautiful walls. This is truly the most amazing room ever. Um, I'll talk today about my favorite uh, topic, epigenetic aging. Um, I pr I'll present new material. Um, just to remind everyone, um, cytosine methylation um, based aging biomarkers have three unique properties. Um, first of all, they apply to the entire life course. You can measure age uh, in prenatal samples. They really measure development to a large extent. Um, the second uh, property is you can apply them to all tissue types. You can build so-called pan-tissue clocks and contrast that with proteomics clocks or transcriptomic clocks. It's much harder to translate a clock that works in, for protein levels in blood to another um, organ. And um, the third property about cytosine methylation is you can build so-called pan-mammalian clocks, um, clocks that apply to all mammalian species in the sense there's one regression model one set of highly conserved cytosines that allows you to measure aging in all these species. And um, to flesh out this last point about pan-mammalian clocks, I want to show you um, results from the Mammalian Methylation Consortium. Um, this is now um, work by Ake Lu. And um, here I show you one of our pan-mammalian clocks um, the left panel shows you how a cross-validation estimate of methylation age correlates with chronologic age of the different species. And um, so on the age axis, uh, you see then a correlation 0.98. These clocks are very good. However, um, the right panel shows you the mathematical trick we are using. Um, here the x-axis um, reports relative age, which is defined as the ratio of chronologic age divided by the maximum lifespan of the species. So mathematically, you have a number between 0 and 1. That's your dependent variable. And then you use a regression model to predict relative age. And the correlation here of 0.95 is remarkable, given that it's unbiased. So, um, so yes, one can build these pan-mammalian clocks. And here, I apply this clock to a particular species, upper left Homo sapiens. You get a correlation of 0.96. So these pan-mammalian clocks typically are not as accurate as a species-specific clock. If you have a clock for humans, it will be more accurate, but still quite accurate. The upper middle panel shows you the accuracy in a mouse, slightly less accurate. Um, but again, remarkable that it's one regression model. And then other species, dogs, elephants, and bats. And you could ask yourself uh, the following question. Is it easier to build an epigenetic clock for a long-lived species, such as humans or elephants, or is it easier to build an epigenetic clock for short-lived species, a mouse, a rat, and so on? And um, fortunately, we know the answer. Um, and the answer is, there is no difference, you know. <laughs> so here I show, um, to visualize that result, um, you see, hopefully, the dashed line in the middle, and the dashed line, sorry, the dashed line um, 
um, re records maximum lifespan. So the, the different species are arranged by lifespan from short-lived to very long-lived. And here you see solid lines, and these solid lines are um, age correlations for the, the pan-mammalian clocks. And what you see is there is no pattern, you know, so um, the clocks are as accurate in long-lived as in short-lived species. And to me, that tells us something about epigenetic aging processes. Um, sorry, this looks strange. <laughs> um, I need better glasses, I think. Um, <laughs> basically, I... Um, we evaluated these uh, pan-mammalian clocks in human epidemiological cohorts and a Framingham Heart Study Women's Health Initiative, and yes, they predict mortality risk. Um, they're weak predictors of mortality risk. I would never use them for that purpose, but it's a proof of concept that this pan-mammalian clock does relate to mortality risk, so it's interesting. And um, now I want to show you some um, results. Um, many of you are very familiar with this idea that um, mutations in the somatotropic axis uh, relate to lifespan. Um, there are these uh, very famous dwarf mice, Snell mice, Laron syndrome mice, growth hormone receptor knockout mice. So the, Decades of research by brilliant people have delineated when certain mice live longer and when not, you know. And um, several people have looked at these transgenic mice. Um, for example, Vadim Gladyshev has um, uh, um, applied his mouse clocks to these mice and shown um, that they are... Um, that, um, um, dwarf mouse status is associated with slower epigenetic aging using a mouse clock. So um, we kind of revisited these um, studies um, in collaboration with Richard Miller. And here I show you how the universal pan-mammalian clocks relate to different uh, transgenic mice. And um, the, um, the columns report results for a snail mouse. The middle column is, um, are the results for a full-body growth hormone receptor knockout mouse model. And um, the rows are different um, tissue types. So what do we learn? In any tissue type we looked at in the snail mouse, we saw slower epigenetic aging, which is nice. And similarly, when we looked at full-body growth hormone knockout in different tissues, uh, brain, kidney, liver, again, we saw epigenetic rejuvenation. But then there was a transgenic mouse where we didn't see um, rejuvenation. And this is the so-called liver-specific growth hormone receptor knockout mouse. So, um, and, um, so just to um, explain that, here um, is one re reference from John Kopchik's lab where they generated these liver-specific growth hormone knockout mice. And interestingly, these mice do not exhibit longer lifespan. I mean, they do have lower IGF-1 levels, but they don't live longer. And as I told you here, interestingly, again, the epigenetic clocks mirror that lifespan uh, prediction. So it's interesting, to me at least. And, um, but then I liked the results a lot. And the reason is, a couple of years ago, Greg Fahey published a human clinical trial, a phase one study, which was a bit controversial among the aging uh, researchers. Um, why? Because he had developed a cocktail of human growth hormone, metformin, DHEA, and vitamin D, and administered it to um, these individuals and observed epigenetic rejuvenation. And um, now, Nia Basilai mentioned that that was due to metformin, but <laughs> um, in this talk we now talk about growth hormone. It was paradoxical. It's, it's, it was a conundrum. Why is it that increased levels of circulating IGF-1 in these adult males 
were associated with lower epigenetic age instead of the opposite, you know. And um, so, yeah, I, I like, therefore, this result that the liver-specific growth hormone knockout mice, which also um, obviously have lower IGF-1 levels, but they, there was no effect on epigenetic age. So in certain ways, we have de decoupled circulating IGF-1 levels from epigenetic clocks in these mice, you know, and, and in that clinical trial. And um, the punchline seems to be that timing is really everything. Um, so the, when you administer um, one intervention, during a developmental phase, let's say between weeks one and eight in a mouse, early postnatal development, um, that may be beneficial, but then later in life that same intervention may actually be bad for you, you know. I mean, it's all trivial stuff, antagonistic pleiotropy, but I think that's what we observe also in these epigenetic clock studies. Oops. Um, sorry. I. What is that? Um, not now. Um, I talked a lot about dwarf mice, and yes, dwarf mice show slower epigenetic aging. But um, what about the opposite? There are these human um, disorders, human overgrowth disorders, um, such as Sotos syndrome and Tatten Brown Raman syndrome. Um, which have interestingly been shown to exhibit positive increased epigenetic age acceleration. So it's beautiful, right? Dwarf mice, slower epigenetic age, overgrowth disorders, increased epigenetic age. So um, I feel, oops. So overall, I think there's by now strong evidence that epigenetic clocks relate to this somatotropic axis. And um, I remind you, um, apart from dwarf mice, um, many of us have shown that caloric restriction um, slows epigenetic aging, or conversely, high-fat diet, obesity increases epigenetic age. So it all ties in with that idea. This is, um, I want to remind you, um, one of the strongest interventions to reset epigenetic age are the Yamanaka fa factors, OSKM. So here I show you the results for our pan-mammalian clock um, applied to human fibroblasts. And after 11 days of administering these OSKM factors, then we start to see the decrease. So maybe one needs to wait quite a while to, to see rejuvenation. Um, coming back to the um, pan-mammalian project, um, we um, of course, correlate individual cytosines to age in many, many species. And um, one of the biologic insights is that age-related gain of methylation can be observed in bivalent chromatin regions um, bound by PRC2, uh, PRC2 target sites. And I want to draw your attention to one of the top genes on the it's called LHFPL4. It has a p-value of 10 to the minus 1,000. It relates to age in, in most species and in most tissues. And, um, but the question is, well, what happens at the chromatin level? And so recently, we, um, Rob Lowe looked at um, single-cell attack-seek data in human bone marrow at these top target sites of the mammalian consortium, the top heads, what happens with the chromatin. And what happens is the chromatin compactifies, you know. So yeah, I mean, it's in hindsight expected. You gain methylation, the chromatin compactifies at these loci in differentiated cells, you know. Um, all right. Um, now I want to uh, talk about what um, I call gold standard perturbations of epigenetic clocks. Pro-aging, high-fat diet in, in mouse liver, you age the liver faster, Down syndrome. There are a couple of progeria that relate to um, epigenetic clocks, but not all. The market exception is Hutchinson's Guilford. But um, anyways, trisomy 21, no question. Now, anti-aging 
caloric restriction in mouse liver, and then I showed you the dwarf mice. And I want to briefly talk about parabiosis um, and this idea of young blood. So, um, overall, it relates to this hallmark of aging that we call cell-cell communication. And there, by now, is quite some literature that says that, yes, cell-cell communication very much affects epigenetic clocks. Um, there was one study by Harold Ketcher and um, Sangavi, um, Akshay Sangavi, who showed that a plasma fraction, a young plasma fraction administered to rats rejuvenated the rats. And um, then Vadim Gladyshev and Bohan Zhang um, have shown that parabiosis experiments in female, um, female black um, six mice um, also show this rejuvenating effect. And then more recently, Consuelo Boras showed that um, stem cell derived extracellular vesicles uh, administered to mice rejuvenate various mouse tissues. And finally, there was a human clinical trial by James Clement that uh, showed that. So yeah, um, overall, um, so young blood in essence uh, uh, seems to, or young plasma, um, uh, seems to rejuvenate several organs in multiple species. Um, now, um, I keep talking about caloric restriction, and um, yesterday um, Joe Takahashi gave this wonderful presentation of his um, study of circadian alignment of caloric restriction. And remember how he showed that CR coupled with restricting the feeding schedule led to the maximum in terms of life extension. And so Joe um, um, also generated liver methylation data from these very same mice. And um, on the, um, in the left panel, you see our epigenetic age estimates. And they largely track these lifespan results. So I was very pleased with that, you know. So overall, um, the, this epigenetic, in this case, uh, this, is a, uh, this is not our universal clock. It's a pan tissue mouse clock applied to liver. But it recapitulated largely um, this result from Joe Takahashi. Um, and this, of course, is where we want to go as a field. Why do we work on epigenetic clocks? Well, at some point, we want to replace lifespan studies um, with just a biomarker measurement. I wouldn't say we are there yet, but I can definitely uh, see us getting there. Um, let's see. Oh, um, before I end, I want to mention we've updated our Grim Age clock from Arkelu. It's version 2. Um, version 1 was already remarkably robust, which is why we used it in a couple of clinical trials. But we now have a version 2. We call it a tuned clock. It's, um, we cut the technical noise by half. And um, we added a couple of uh, methylation estimators of biomarkers people care about. So you give us a blood methylation uh, profile, we estimate hemoglobin A1C and C-reactive protein. And, uh, and then these methylation estimates are part of the new version of GRIMH. And here I just want to show you the middle panel. These um, epigenetic clocks predict lifespan both in smokers and non-smokers. So, um, so yes, they do track smoking, but you can predict lifespan in never smokers. You can really come up with any stratification you want. You can stratify by sex, you can stratify by race, ethnicity, by smoking status, whatever you do to the data, the clock still predict um, lifespan. Um, I'll end with saying um, we have methylation-based estimators of mammalian maximum lifespan and other life history traits. So, um, so methylation also relates to species characteristics. And I think I'll stop with that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Steve. That was really amazing. We have, uh, we have time for some questions. Maybe I can start 
with the question. So, so are we, how far are we in terms of sort of prospective clinical trials um, and using this maybe as a health mark in the clinic? Um, we are ready. We've been ready for a year. <laughs> um, we want to lower the costs, you know, so um, typically these, um, when you use an Illumina Epic Array, I want to say the costs are $200 per sample. Right. I think in terms of biomarkers, we are there. You know, there are wonderful posters here on various epigenetic clocks, you know, so there is a, a huge community effort. So okay. wonderful biomarkers, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, this gentleman has a great poster about uh, a great clock. <laughs> yeah. Wait. Yeah. I'm sorry? Okay, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, my question for you was specifically on the, um, the one particular, I forgot the name of the gene that you were showing that had very high... Uh, LHFPL4. LHFPL4. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. have, you, have you had any insights on sort of doing like something like CRISPR off to knock that methylation out and see how that affects in different mice or maybe some other method to see what the effects are of removing or yeah, you know, around with that? I, I, so I showed you this single cell attack data in human bone marrow. What I am sure of, chromatin compactifies. Then the next question is, well, does it affect the transcriptome right, of that gene? And my short answer is, I don't think so, you know. And um, this brings us to this embarrassment in the field, you know, that these meth it's very difficult to relate methylation uh, changes to neighboring genes. And, um, and I'm getting to the point where I believe more in long distance interactions, you know. So I, I just, um, or we as the field simply have to move away from transcriptomics. Uh, personally, I've done that. I've given up on transcriptomics. I'm, I'm much more interested in proteomic changes, you know. Or maybe we need to look at regulatory RNAs, you know, but uh, it's just difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. I think we will have to move on in, Thanks. in the, <laughs> because of time. But thank you so much, Steve. That was, uh, that was really amazing. Uh, and